Oh boy, this is a great episode. We actually interviewed one of our favorite people, Jason Kalipa. Great, great podcast. But what you're watching this for is to see what the giveaway is, aren't you? You greedy, greedy people. All right, here's the giveaway. Maps Performance, free access to Maps Performance. And you enter to win this the same way we have you enter to win the other giveaways that we do. You leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. But you have to also subscribe to this channel and you have to turn on your notifications. If you leave a great comment, but you don't do those other things, you win nothing, you get zero. So do all of those things. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and then you'll get free access to that incredible program. One more thing before we start this episode, we are this month taking Maps Anabolic, combining it with the No BS six pack formula. They fit perfectly together, and we discounted the price tremendously. So you can get access to both right now for $59.99. That's a huge savings, huge discount. If you're interested, head over to mapsoctober.com. All right, here comes the show. Almost a year today when you were uh, on the show, Sal did a kind of a compilation of a bunch of gym owners that we respect in the space. Uh, you were the representation uh, for the CrossFit space. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we asked you, because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were asking you about how you were going to pivot. You were talking about how, you know, some of the employees that were just not working were going to have to furlough. You were doing some things with memberships where you were allowing people that were going to help support you, that they would be able to credit that towards their next. You were also in the middle of starting to pivot into some sort of a streaming service to try and complement what's going on with COVID. So where I really want to go is I want to pick up uh, kind of from there, what has happened as far as your staffing? Uh, are the same amount of gyms still open? What happened with the streaming? Are you continuing on? Like, catch us up to uh, where you went from the beginning of COVID. Oh, man, that's a lot to unpack. So COVID for our business has been detrimental in some ways and um, phenomenal in others. And I know that sounds weird, but- Is it a net positive or a net negative? From a revenue perspective, net negative. Okay. From a growth and potential, I think definitely positive. Oh, interesting. Because I mean, so take for example our Mountain View gym. Revenue there was <clears throat> was very good. It got turned off and it didn't get turned on for 15 months later. Wow. Gosh. So when you know, when revenue on a location that had, you know, five, six hundred active members at two hundred dollars a month gets turned to zero, it's gonna take us a while to build that back up. So um, but the, the long and short of it is over the last year, uh, we have been very, very fortunate because of some pivots that we did. We've been able to retain key talent. We've been able to pay everybody on the team in some fashion, more money than what they got the year before. That was, oh, wow. the, that was the goal. So if you're a coach at our gyms, you're getting paid more than you were the year before. Like mm. we, we increased everybody's salaries or everybody's wages. And the reason why I think we were able to do that is one is we got to, we got to see who was really bought into the vision and what we wanted to do, which was great. They got to see that we were taking care of them. We, we continued to pay them. And then we, we pivoted to digital and we, we had a few opportunities um, come up from a corporate wellness perspective. So we did end up closing one location through COVID uh, like permanently. That was our one on Stevens Creek. And that, um, that was tough, right? But we made the best, we had to take our ego out of it and say, Hey, what is going to be best for our business? to keep us sustainable and removing that location was what we needed to do. But we just opened a new location um, on Friday in Pleasanton. Very cool. We just, we took over an existing gym and now we're reopening it as our gym. And so, so we're kind of net zero there. Also throughout COVID, we launched a license program, which we learned a lot about. We launched it a little over a year ago. We kind of cast a wider net, learned that we probably should have consolidated. And so they were one year, annual licenses, we've now um, kind of made the barrier to entry a little bit higher moving forward. I think we made it a little bit too low in the beginning. So we launched a license. We rolled out a new um, uh, virtual tra training app. We expanded our collective position, which is B2B tools for gym owners. We really tried to support them and um, and we opened a new location. So there's been a lot going on. In corporate talk, wellness, we, we, we opened a new location with that as well. Talk to me, how, how's the licensing work? What exactly is that for other gym owners to license like your programs or what are they, what are they getting in the licensing? Yeah, so our company, NC Fit, was founded here in the Bay Area in 2008. And 
we we have um, a few different verticals. So vertical number one is we own brick and mortar gyms, which through COVID, again, has been very, very difficult. So that's number one. We have um, corporate wellness sites with uh, a few different companies globally, which which again was really unique because what we were dealing with here in California is different than what we were dealing with in Malaysia or Thailand or Singapore, where we have these locations. We were able to see what their governments were reacting like. And then we have... Um, digital products. We have an end consumer product, which is our app. It's called NC Fit. And we also have a gym owner app, which is uh, programming and session planning. So what the license model was, was them utilizing our likeness. In the beginning, what we said was there was some turmoil that happened in CrossFit. And looking back on it, I wish things didn't go down the way they did, but um, some things happened with CrossFit and we had a lot of demand for people to align with the brand and move forward with. And so we rolled out the license program to give them a company that they could feel like, okay, we're providing them monthly webinars. We're providing them business tools. We're providing them all these different things. We rolled that out a year ago. Now, did you know that? Sorry, I, I want to yeah. stop you right there because did you know that when you were doing the licensing? Because there was a lot of drama in CrossFit right. just about a year ago or so. And we talked about it on our show a little bit. Did you have the foresight to know that that was happening? And then the licensing deal was a brilliant pivot that, oh, a lot of people are going to be jumping ship from CrossFit and I'm going to capture all that. Or were you already in the thick of it and that just played into your hand? Yeah. So it, it was it was a little bit of timing. So we had already known. So we have these collective gyms. We have a thousand gyms. The only reason why I share that is because it's a large enough audience where it attracts certain people that want more. So this audience, they use our programs but they wanted more from us. And so they were requesting it. They said, hey, we want to dive deeper with your brand. And we didn't have a solution at the time. Well, when we had talked about it, we started kind of incorporating some of this license model. And then when everything happened with CrossFit, it sped up our timeline because these people in the collective were requesting to dive deeper with the brand. If I could do it all over again, maybe we would have done it a little bit different, but I'm glad that it happened because it taught us a lot about the license model. We originally started out with a low barrier to entry. It was $2,000. It was low touch point. Kind of we're going to provide this variety of tools, but let's open up to a wider audience. As we pursued the license program, we realized maybe that's not what we want. We want to have a little bit more control, want a little bit more consistency. So we created more um, like we've created better guidelines that people need to follow brand guidelines. And we've reduced that down now to eight formal license partners and everybody else just stuck with the collective position. I see. Hmm. Okay. So this is actually, you're, you're the perfect person to ask this because you had so many clubs and gyms in different areas. You named Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia. <laughs> You've got them obviously here in California and other places. So during the pandemic, governments acted very differently depending on where you were, or at least place different regulations and restrictions on health clubs differently depending on the areas. Were, did you have two areas that really were very different in how you had to, you know, fought, what guidelines you had to follow and, and what was the, what were the challenges with that? Like in other words, California versus Thailand or whatever, what were the two big differences that you saw? The, the, the biggest differences was the timing of everything. So like, let's just take China. We have a location in a place called Shenzhen, China. And that's a corporate wellness site for us, but we run it, we operate it. It's, it's our, it's our gig that got shut down first. Whereas then you started the trickle effects, right? Mm. And then you saw Malaysia and then we saw Philippines and then one company, one country would reopen and the other one would close. And so I think everybody acted similarly. The problem was, is that they're all on different timelines. So like we would never know when we were opening, reclosing, reopening, being outdoors, doing this. And that same thing happened in California. I mean, California was extremely restricting and we saw our collective or our licensed partners be able to open. That was really frustrating to see that gyms, let's just say in Texas or Florida that we license our mark to are able to be open and here in California, we couldn't. And so from a government perspective, I think we saw a bunch of different ways it was handled. California was probably the most restricting that I saw, um, but the timeline made it the most difficult because it was hard for us to get our grasp around what was happening because you had, we had to be reactive every single time. And that was the toughest part about owning gyms here in California was that you, you, we were closed and they say, okay, now you can be open outdoors. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, actually just kidding. You can't be, you can't be open outdoors. And we had just bought a new tent and we had just brought the, and then it's like, okay, now you can be indoors with social distancing. Oh, you know what? Nope. You can't be indoors. You need to go back outside. Well, now I need to go rent a tent again. 
And I, I think that in theory, people were trying to make these decisions, but they didn't actually take into account what impact that has on small business because it is very difficult to run a business in the first place. And now you're adding this, this characteristic that's completely outside my control that makes it even tougher. Mm, which market was the most challenging for you? Was it California? California, yeah, for sure. By far? Yeah. Now, did there, you take the biggest financial hit too in California? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, now, I, I should note though, globally and licensed partner, our financial implications weren't the same because those were a little bit bigger corporate contracts that were that were treated slightly different. Right now, we're dealing with the biggest challenge in California is rent. So if you had a location that had high rents, there's a lot of conversation occurring right now between landlords and tenants about what is owed. Mm. And there's two different rules of thought here. So this is this is a, in, we'll see what happens. But the tenant says, hey, per my lease, I'm, I'm, I get access to the building, right? That's, that's what I signed a lease for. Mm -hmm. The government mandated me to not be able to use it. So I shouldn't owe rent for that time. That's, that's the tenant position potentially. Mm -hmm. The landlord's like, Hey, you signed a lease. Right. You're on the hook. I still got to pay my mortgage. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's a very, uh, We'll see what happens. So, uh, so yeah. what are you seeing? Are you seeing anything? Or is there like negotiating that's happening where some some landlords are being, are you having some that are being pricks and wanting to go all the way yeah. and then others, like what are, you, what are you seeing? So from all the people in the industry that I talk to, because I, I, I want to, you know, there's, there's, there's something about, I think at the end of the day, everybody's gonna have to take a haircut of some type somewhere. That's what I think will happen. I, you have three different types of landlords. Number one, they, they, they super feel empathetic for the situation and they're just going to forgive things or maybe push it to the end of the lease. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. There's another group. It's like, Hey, I get it. We need to settle up 50, 50 or some type of cons consideration. Then you have some are like, no, like we're going to go to court or whatever will happen. They're, they're based on everybody I talked to. There's like three different groups. And from the legal exchanges that I've seen, uh, it's it's kind of up in the air, depend, now, depending. Now, Jason, you have you exhibit a lot of the characteristics of a uh, successful entrepreneur in the sense that even at the beginning of this uh, conversation, you have this very positive spin on challenges, and I think that's just the characteristic of successful business people. It's like you met with the challenge. I can either be pissed off about it, or I could figure out a direction to go. I can't think, and I want I would love to know from a personal perspective because here you are your your job and your passion is getting people healthy oh. and fit oh yeah mm -hmm. they're telling of of all the businesses they're telling to shut down they're hardest on gyms which which actually help people improve their health then we see studies that show that the top risk factor for severe you know symptoms of covid obesity and comorbidities which fitness helps then we see a study comes out that shows that gyms were not major vectors of transmission, probably because people don't work out when they don't feel good, uh, which you know naturally will happen. So you're met with all this, plus you're met with the fact that you're forced to shut down. You can't help people, even if they don't mind coming in and risking, and you take the risk of helping them, you can't do it. Like, how did you handle this personally? Like, how did you not throw your hands up and say, fuck it, I'm done, or just lose your mind? Dude, I mean, what you're talking about is highly emotional for me, right? I, I mean, I'll give you a really good example. We, we our, our business was asked to re-shut down. And I'm, you see this business, you've spent your life's work, right? I started this out of college when I was 21. And your life's work, something you've put your whole heart into, and then something that's completely outside your control shuts down your business. When you sign a lease, you're never thinking like a governmental agency is going to come and shut me down. Yeah. You think, oh, okay, I might not get enough members or whatever. And I'll never forget the way I felt when uh, when Newsom re-shut down businesses in December or whatnot. And then he goes to French Laundry that night. My heart, like, I just sank because you just felt like, man, pissed off. But then he had to realize like, hey, man, like me being upset, me being frustrated at this situation, it's not going to help anything, nothing. What is occurring is completely outside my control. And what's in my control is pivoting the business the best I can, supporting our members the best I can, and ultimately staying here and reopening so that our members can have a place as an outlet. But to say that I wasn't frustrated on that day and every other day when I saw liquor stores open and our gym had to be mandated to close was... It was, it was, it was very, very difficult. But again, I just go back to this idea. Like, what do I want to do about it? Like mm -hmm. I had two options. Option A, say, Hey, I'm not going to abide by any state and county laws. I'm going to stay open. That's, that's one. You could, you could go that way. Mm -hmm. 
Another one is you're going to say, okay, I'm going to abide by state and county laws. And we chose as, as a business, we drew a line in the sand and said, hey, we're going to abide by state and county laws. Was that the right move? I think yes. I think as a whole, it was it was because we took an unbiased position on it. If we had chosen to take a biased position, we said, hey, we're going to stay open. But then where do you draw the line on that? And this way we used a third party to dictate what we did. But it was very, very difficult, especially personally. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine probably the biggest challenge is when you finally, you know, you, you, you tuck your head down and you go, all right. We'll follow your rules. And then they change the rules. It Once seems like yeah. every other month. Yeah. And it's almost like, okay, what the what am I supposed to do? I did what you said. Now you're saying this, and I'm still doing that. And now you're saying this. Like, you know, and for me, it's very frustrating. We all came from the gym industry. And when I saw this, it broke my heart. Now, none of us own gyms, but I've owned gyms. And I couldn't imagine being put in that position. And seeing them change the rules every other week and it's like, all right. Uh, but, what, but, but what, you know, like what did I do? I went in the garage and I worked out. What did yeah. I do? I, I, <laughs> I, I filmed videos to help our members. What did I do? I thought about, hey, Excellent. what can I do to make a positive impact? Because look, don't get me wrong. Did I have bad days? Of course. But my family and I have been through some really tough things with my daughter getting leukemia and having to overcome challenges. And this was just another challenge and there's going to be more in the future. And so what am I going to do, right? What, what are you going to do? You're going to crumble up on a ball or you're gonna say, okay, hey, this is a this is a, a a critical time. What could we do to service our support our members and to make sure that we have a business to come back to? And I continued to remind myself that, and I had really good people around me who didn't allow me to go into that negative headspace mm -hmm. because you could so do it and play the victim. But playing the victim there, just yes. Uh, the way I handled what you're talking about is saying, hey, if I don't like the way they're handling this we need to get new leadership in place. And so maybe that's something that I need to pursue better in the future is that just the fact that they didn't take into consideration what would happen in these small businesses or even now with different types of mandates and whatnot, the, the least common, deno the common denominator is like this coach at the gym who's just trying to serve, you know, help their members. And now they have to mandate masks and, and, and police who's wearing a mask and who's not. That's very unfortunate that our leadership has put those people in that position. So maybe we need to rethink that position. Yeah. So with 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 what happened, um, I was reading some statistics uh, actually the other day, and it showed that during this period of time, obesity and chronic health issues in general just spiked. And this is predictable, right? People weren't moving, stressed out. They're drinking eating more. Eating more, drinking more. Yeah. Did you Have you noticed a rebound effect? In other words, when things start to reopen, more people being like, man, I didn't realize how important... <laughs> moving was but now that i've been forced to not move like i want to, like did you see yeah. that rebound effect did you feel that so uh, there, there's 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 a, a blessing and a curse here so the the we have four brick and mortars here in the bay area and those are really good test cases and we are seeing them get back on track but they're nowhere near where they were not, not even close now technically as of today we still have mask mandates here in the <clears throat> santa clara county mm -hmm. and other counties we're in right I think those are going to be removed soon, which I think will help public perception. Um, but man, the feedback from our members, like even I remember when we had outdoor um, canopies, right? And like our business was taking even a further loss. And I just remember walking in and just this woman, just like she like, she was practically like pleading with me, like, or not, not pleading. She was like, just so thankful, almost like on her knees, thankful that we, we had this place for her that, that this outlet, a place where she can enhance her fitness that she had been just cooped up in her house. And when you get those messages over and over for people, it just inspires you to keep building because you know that eventually they'll, they'll all be coming back. And I think what we're going to have in the fitness space is like a, a roaring 20s, like in about in the Bay Area in about three months. I think that coming into the new year, when public perception shifts a little bit more from COVID around this area, I'm talking California in particular, mask mandates are gone. I think coming into the new year, we're going to just see it just boom for like the next three to five years because people miss that sense of community. Yeah, I, I like what you said with blessing and curse. We we just did a podcast on the effects of exercise and fitness on on mild to moderate anxiety and depression. A lot of people don't know Ooh, yeah. that exercise is tremendously beneficial for mental and psychological well-being, not just physical well-being. Is this something that people are realizing more now in terms of your members and maybe even your, yourself? Because I know initially when people work out, it's all about changing the physical. 
But now that they've gone through what kind of what's what's happened, are you hearing more people say things like, "Look, you know, I know I want to lose weight before, but uh, this I need this for my my mental health." It's the health. best hour of my day. This is this is I am so excited to be here. I feel better when I leave. I mean, we have a um, therapist that's in a psychologist who's in there, and she's saying that her her patients have skyrocketed. Right, of mm. course, like a lot of these psychologists, therapists have, and. People are using the gym as that best hour of their day. They're out there, especially if you're still working remotely. Imagine if you have, you know, two parents are working remotely, they're at their house, their kids are, you know, in the house, especially during COVID. This this gym is is an is a place where they could just kind of let their mind be free, listen to the coach and enhance their body. It's I don't know. I, I think for that reason alone, like our 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 gyms, I feel like we're doing a positive thing for the community. And I just can't wait for more and more people to come and experience it. And we need to do a better job continuously sharing the message to come in. So are you seeing that demand grow for coming back to the physical location versus being at home and kind of going through the streaming? And I know you had to kind of provide that service yeah. for people uh, just because of, you know, circumstances. But because uh, we speculated initially that like there might be some people that want to just stay home now uh, indefinitely almost and not come back to the gym. But are you seeing kind of a shift there? I mean, it's a difficult it's a difficult so our numbers in the gym are not what Hard they were pre-covid right, right? Yeah. so you can say okay is it because they're going to permanently stay home on digital fitness whatever they build garage gyms or is it they're not ready yet or is it because their companies haven't opened up back up yet so they're not commuting in to google for example so that's why they're not coming to our mountain view gym i would say that i think the future looks like I think people don't realize what they had until it's gone mm -hmm. and they miss that culture that we created. And it, now it's our responsibility to remind them of what that, what that felt like. Like when you come in, like, I, I don't know about you guys, but like, you know, I work out in my garage a lot. I also work out at our gyms every single day. and I take class. When you go into a class, when you go to the gym, even with your, with your boys at the gym, if one of you is not having like a great day, not like, but just not really feeling it, body's a little bit beat up, whatever you start feeding off the energy in the room. And all of a sudden, like maybe one person isn't feeling it, but everybody else is. And then you start feeling it. After that warm up, you're vibing. At our gyms, you see that. Like people just come in and they know that as soon as they walk in the door, everything else is taken care of that. Whereas in the garage, it's not like that. You can go into the garage, you can be feeling kind of beat up and whatnot. And you can have a really terrible workout just because you're uninspired, you're not ready to rock. But when you go into a place and you're surrounded by other people, I think that happens. But I think what you'll see is a hybrid model moving forward. I think you're going to see people who are going to work at at home two, three days a week, let's just say one or two days a week, and they're going to come in two or three days a week. That's what I think. I want to back you up. You you glossed over something that I, I did you say that you have a therapist in your gym? We, I mean, like, member. like, like as, oh, well, as a I mean, member. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we have I thought you offer that as a service or something. Well, no, so I, I used a sports therapist for a really long time and good friend of ours, but no, just as one of our members, right? Oh, Cause we it. have, we have some really unique, that's one of the best things about the gym, by the way, is you have people from all walks of life. Like, oh, my favorite. Yeah. It's my yeah. favorite thing. Dude. Yeah. We used to, yeah. We have, we've had a lot of different people come through the yeah. gym. I, one of my favorite things about training people was I got to train executives and doctors and therapists and teachers. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. You learn from them. So what was this? Okay. So let's talk about this digital streaming, you know, way of delivering fitness. Cause it's, although it's fitness, very different than delivering fitness in person in brick and mortar. What were some of the hurdles and challenges? Did you have some preconceptions that later on you're like, oh, wait, it's actually different than that? Like, what was that process like? I, I would imagine that's a steep learning curve. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to help people, you know, kind of. What, what my whole theory is, is like, I want our business, NC Fit, to represent a, a brand of fitness that helps people never allow fitness to inhibit what they want to do or need to do in life. That's really important to me. Like mm -hmm. I want to provide them the tools that if you need to go chase after your kid, you can, if you need to go get off the toilet, you can, um, or if you want to go do a climb, you can. And providing that online is a lot different than providing that in person. Cause in person you can create that conversation. Like we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. online, we've obviously we've invested heavily into the app space. So that's a, that's a, that's a different piece. But what we've had to figure out is how are people actually using the product and how do we provide the most value for them? And I think what we didn't do well enough and that we're working on now is what, wh how do we show them and track their results better in a, in a way that resonates with them? That's not necessarily like a leaderboard and mm -hmm. things like that. That's common in CrossFit. For us, it's how do we show them visibly that they're changing? So those are things we're working on. But I think what we've learned a lot through the digital space is that 
we tried to bring the experiences from in the gym to them digitally by having on-demand content from coaches that actually coach in the gym. So like we are a brick and mortar business that also has an online. We are not just an online company. I think for that, we bring a different culture to what we pre present online because it's more coach forward. So the, for example, our follow along workouts are done by coaches who actually coach class. And so I think the members can appeal to it more because they know how to talk to the members just like they do in the gym. So that's what we're trying to bring to the people yeah, online. Now, now looking at it from the outside, uh, it started off as a necessity, Yep. but let's just pretend it's not a necessity. Right. Do you still think it's a good idea? Do you still think that this is a good direction to go and it could grow you guys beyond what you could normally grow with the brick and mortar? Yeah. I mean, our goal since day one, this is 2008, has always been to enhance people's life through fitness, right? Mm -hmm. We've been wanting to do that. And more importantly, right, like I said before, enabling them, giving them the tools to be able to go do stuff outside the gym, which I think is even more important. And we're not going to be for everybody and that's okay. We're, we're going to be for people who want to put in the effort and want to work hard. And the type of workouts we have are more functional in nature. But this app is very important because the available market is in direct alignment with what our core values are, which is trying to get this to the people who are ready to hear it. Mm. If we're just in our brick and mortars, we're going to be limited by those spaces. What if you have someone in Missouri that we don't have a location at? I still want to be able to impact them. Yeah. When you look at when you look at the total, and I don't know if you have this data or not. It'd be interesting to see pre-COVID uh, the the total amount of lives that you were touching in in brick and mortar uh, versus now with the app combined. Are you do you know if you're reaching the same more? Because obviously the brick and mortars we've already discussed are significantly you know lower and have right. been hurt because of everything like that. But because you did the app and now you have a different reach, have you been able to track and see like the total amount of people you're yeah. touching? I think that we are touching more people, but I want to do a better job in 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 touching them, if that makes sense. Like I think in our brick and mortars, we would do a really good job of community events, really trying to help people improve their lifestyle Yeah. because we have those coaches online. There's, it's a little bit more surface level mm -hmm. and we want to do a better job engaging with them further. And that's on us. And so to at total amount of people, I think it's more Yeah. deeper level is not quite there yet. And that's what we're focused on right now. When you look at NC fit and you compare it to basic CrossFit gyms or maybe other brands that are trying to do similar stuff to you, what are you most proud of that you've created? I think for us, it's a practical application of this methodology. So like if you think about like CrossFit traditionally, what we did is we've just pivoted it a little bit to be more in line with what people want. Um, which is every day I just want someone to come in have, have fun. I need them to have fun. If they're not having fun, they're not going to keep coming back in. I want them to learn a little something new and ultimately I want them to get in a great workout. I think that's where NC fit thrives is having professional coaches that allow you to have a great time. And, um, now that sounds like a CrossFit gym though. How, how is it, that different? Tell me how that's different. I think the biggest difference is the consistency that we provide across our locations. So you might go to one CrossFit gym and have a dramatically different experience uh, than, than ours. Hmm. So ours, the consistency really matters. So, you know, when you go into one facility of yours versus another one across the world. Yeah, they're all being trained the same way, same onboarding system, same internship program, same daily session plans, same daily videos they're watching to prepare for that class, same execution. Mm. It, it's like it's like walking into a Starbucks, but allowing the barista to still have their own personality, of course, mm. right? But we are going to train them so, so much that they're, we're going to give them all the tools to provide the best class on the floor. You will not have these inconsistencies. Now, what now is, is that, that why yeah. uh, you've limited your amount of like gyms that you've allowed to have like a licensing That's right. deal with you? So we learned that I think what happened was is that we brought a lot of people on the, on the bus mm -hmm. and they were all great. It's just some were more engaged than others and some wanted to, what we found was that um, we needed them all to look similar, feel similar. Otherwise, what we'll have is these major inconsistencies. So we, we had to create better branding guidelines, which we didn't have before for licensed partners. So when you walk into them, you're like, oh, okay, this is an NC fit. And when you watch the way the coach delivers the product, the professionalism behind them, that's that's what it should scream at you. Mm, and you it's not to say that it's, you know, I, look, I love, I love what CrossFit's done. CrossFit mm -hmm. has changed the fitness industry for us. So we had to be in control of our own destiny and brand a way that we had control over the product. And- 
that's that's been very important to us. How is that so different though in like CrossFit gyms? Is that because take me through that because I'm not that experienced with going sure. to a lot of different CrossFit gyms. If I go to one, let's say right down the street, that's a CrossFit gym, and then I drive an hour into the valley, what am I going to see that's so different? Well, you may not see anything that's different, mm. or you may see something vastly different. Ultimately, what CrossFit is, is a license model. So you're paying two, three, four thousand dollars to license the mark, and you could use that mark in a variety of different ways. Um, after a coach receives their level one, they could open up a, the, the barrier to entry is relatively low, which is, a, which is phenomenal. It created opportunities like for me, right? But then eventually, uh, you'll also have varying degrees of gyms. You'll have some that maybe are ran more as a hobby. You'll have others that are ran more as a business. You'll have some with programming that maybe is what the gym owner likes, which is, you know, certain specific, you'll have others that are ran differently. And, and so the inconsistencies, um, it's good and bad. It allows the cream to rise to the top, which I think is really important. It allows a gym owner to express what they want in their business, but it also creates some, like, like we said, some, some branding inconsistencies. Now the strategy with this, take me through this. Do you have an ultimate vision for a licensing a situation where you grow as big as CrossFit eventually with this? Or is this something you want to just limit uh, to make sure that, you know, everything is super consistent? Yeah, no, we, we want to limit this. I mean, we we thought maybe a year or two ago, like, oh, maybe we'll, you know, cast a wide net. We learned very quickly that wasn't the right move for us. We, we want to have a, a smaller group of owners, a smaller group of gyms that are just doing it really, really well. Mm -hmm. And just expressing functional training in, in, in the best way we see possible. And that also means a variety of different programs. So we, we won't just have a more GPP program, which is maybe a little bit more complex. We'll have other things like a fundamental strength conditioning program. And we'll have a variety of different classes offered on our schedule, which I think is important. Some people don't want to snatch or rope climb and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you talked about some of the controversy that happened not that long ago uh, with CrossFit. Now, you had diverged from the brand CrossFit before that all happened, right? Diverged, yeah. You, like you had moved and kind of yeah. – yeah. Now, when, when all that went down, and a lot of it centered around the founder, which was Greg Glassman – when all that went down, were you shocked or was this something that you were like, eh, you know, <laughs> kind of saw the writing on the wall a little bit? So like, look, it's, there is, it is such a complex issue to talk about. There is so much backstory. Um, but we had, we had, um, we had rebranded from NorCal CrossFit to NC Fit to be more in control of our destiny and a variety of different things, especially from a corporate wellness perspective. That was important to us. We couldn't be attached to something we didn't have control over and neither would they want to be attached to something they have no control over. It's right. just business. We we decided to unaffiliate, meaning like not pay our affiliation fees when all this stuff was going down. Looking back on it, would I have handled things a little bit differently? I think so. But I had spoken to Greg. I mean, when I say countless, I mean countless times trying to share insight that there needs to be some level of consistency, some basic business tools we could provide owners so that so that we could create at least a framework to build off of. So you don't have these major inconsistencies when someone's utilizing the brand because it makes it very difficult for you. So Greg was uh, you know, didn't didn't really want those things. Very libertarian. Yeah, he was very libertarian and he uh, yeah. He, was I surprised at what happened? Um, yes and no. Um, he was who he was and he's unapologetic about that. And for that reason alone, I give him a lot of respect that he says what he wants to say and he doesn't mm -hmm. care what anybody else thinks. And that's his position as a privately held company. He can do whatever the hell he wants. But as soon as it starts impacting our business, then it becomes our, our challenge. Yeah, you know, you you've been you had started with them so early that you saw the explosion and the rise and kind of now where it's at now is the public perception or even within your space is the perception of the CrossFit brand is it different? Is it changed? Is is the is the energy and mood around it like it's not what it used to be and it's kind of going downhill. We got to kind of do our own thing. Is this a growing belief in the space? It's a great question. Um First off, I think CrossFit saw a really huge boom between like 2010, 11, and 2015, 16. Yeah. Saw a huge boom. Explosion. Cross but what's really unique about CrossFit is that it's three things. It's a fit, it's a brand, it's, it's a methodology, and it's a sport. And that's really unlike anything else I've ever heard of, right? So when you think about like yoga, like there's no trademark to that or Pilates or 
uh, or jujitsu. Right. In CrossFit, there is a trademark. So they've trademarked the name, but they've also kind of aligned it with the methodology. So you could be on board with like the methodology of CrossFit, but maybe you're not on board with the brand of CrossFit. And that's, that's, that's challenging. I don't, from the future perspective, Eric Rosa took over CrossFit about a year ago. And I think that he's done some good things to, to start working towards what I was talking about, which is creating some level of consistency, specifically at the affiliate level. He created an affiliate playbook and things like that. That's all I was talking to Greg about was just like some, some kind of like concepts and ideas, not necessarily rules. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, I do think for some people, I, I don't know, I'd ask you the same thing. Cause I'm kind of in my own, like, uh, uh, I'm in my own the, the uh, own bubble, own bubble, right? Yeah. So, like for me, uh, I do think that maybe it saw its peak, and now it's kind of settled, at, mm -hmm. and maybe you'll see a little bit of growth here and there, but it's kind of settled. Do you think that? I don't know. Yeah, it feels that way. I think they made their mark for sure. I mean, we talked about many times on the show the impact that they had on fitness in general. I mean, in fact, earlier when you had me on your podcast, I talked about managing you know forty thousand square foot big box gyms with one squat rack. Nobody squatted. CrossFit single-handedly got people to barbell squat and deadlift and do some of these lifts that you know people just didn't do before. And I think that's uh, phenomenal. And yes, I do think it does feel like the brand has declined and who knows if it'll rise back I up. I definitely think it's declined or at least plateaued, but I think the methodology lives on. Yes. And I think that we're going to see more people doing what you've done, which yeah. is, Hey, I, I appreciate a lot of things about it and I, I can subscribe to the methodology and I'm going to take some of that and build my own brand and, and use it. So I think we're going to see I agree. that kind of to your point of kind of see a little, like it's kind of plateaued and then see a little growth. I think that's the reason why. I, and I think as far as it being a sport and it being a brand, I think those two things. I think of our. I think we've seen the heyday of that. I think it. It's kind of. Peaked well, you've there. seen spinoffs of the sport. Uh, oh yeah. Do you? Could you like list off a few of those? Because I know there's been a few I've seen on TV. Well, like the that, Grid League. You yeah. talking about that? Yeah. Shit like so like that. there was Grid League that didn't really work. That was. Uh, that was that was that was that didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> like the XFL, dude. Yeah. It's like the yeah. XFL, yeah. Of dude. Uh, these guys just tried to go way too hot, way too quick. More. You know, they they like rented out Madison Square Garden as the first event. It's like, hey, wow, start... I didn't even know that. Yeah, um, but there's other events. So, for example, the Rogue Invitational, which which I'm actually doing. It's called the Legends event here at the end of the month. Uh, that's an event that could have a lot of legs to it because Rogue is a major equipment company mm -hmm. who could pay out big purses and they can get a return because it's a big marketing strategy for them. Yeah, smart. But ultimately, some of these other events, um, the Dubai Fitness Championship, that one has major funding from Dubai. But some of these other ones have gone under because ultimately it's all good and well to create an event, but if there's no return on the investment, eventually you, can, you can't support it. And so how many events and what could you pay and how many new athletes are coming to the sport is something I think about a lot. And the barrier to entry is massive. So think about this for a second. If you played baseball and you became a baseball athlete, maybe you spend what? Three hours a day, two hours a day training your sport or in college, let's just say, or even mm -hmm. the pros, how many hours a day do they train? I, I don't quite know, right? Very skill specific, football, whatever. How many hours a day do they spend on their craft? Uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but I imagine it's somewhere between like three and four hours, mm -hmm. maybe, right? It's a good guess. Yeah. For CrossFit to be good at it and to break from like a regional level athlete to a professional level and actually get a top podium spot to then make real money from sponsors and events. It requires so many hours a day because you can't just be good at strength training. You need to be good at swimming, running, biking, you name it. And so you're spending three hours in the morning on endurance events, midday doing another hour or two of strength events and at night working on gymnastics skills. <laughs> so, so what happens is I wonder if the gap is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger for these athletes where you have certain people that have been able to make in the sport and they're thriving, they're making good money, but they're professional athletes. And that's all they do is train all day. Mm -hmm. But how do you break into that group right. is the tough part because you can't really have a full-time job and break into that gap. No, it, yeah. it, you know, you mentioned earlier Dubai, and I've heard a lot of things about the Middle East and fitness. Bodybuilding is getting big over there. Uh, submission wrestling and jujitsu yeah, is jiu getting big over big. there. You're talking about you know fitness type events. What mar and you're in so many different markets in the world. What markets should we keep an eye on? Obviously, California, the mecca, all that stuff. We know that. 
But what about worldwide? Where are you most excited to see you know, I mean, what's happening? There's a lot of talk about China for CrossFit in particular. I think I think Europe is a, is a big market. I think Australia is a massive market. Um, those in particular, mainly for us, I, I have visibility because they're English speaking, mm. right? Um, there's a lot of English speaking people in those areas. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, like, like China here, you hear a lot about and, uh, the Dubai thing, see, I don't know if Dubai has a massive fitness audience. I think that there's some people there who are very interested in it and they have the money to support. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. Like, so like, for example, the Abu Dhabi, um, championships is a, is a jujitsu competition. It's called ADCC. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest one. They pay out the biggest prize purse. But I don't know how many people from Dubai actually compete in it versus there was just some individuals there who are really bought into jiu-jitsu and they wanted to elevate the sport, so they created it. And they spent a lot of money on it. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, so going back to uh, the shutdowns and the pandemic, um, you know, what was interesting to me, and, and I'd love your input on this, as a fitness professional, seeing how this the one space that could probably benefit people the most during this period of time where we need – to be healthier, we need to have stronger immune systems, and we need outlets just mentally to deal with the stress of all the stuff, and yet it being attacked the most by regulators, I thought to myself, boy, have we done a shitty job communicating the benefits of health and fitness, because if that's the first thing they go after, and that's the thing that they're most strict about with their regulations, like you said, liquor stores were considered more essential than gyms, I thought, we're not doing a, a good job at all. Did this cross your mind at all? And if it did, like, what, what do you think we could do moving forward so that if something ever happens in the future where our health is at risk, that they say gyms are the place we need to protect and figure out how to get people in? If, yeah, I think we need to do a better job. I just think that a lot of people potentially in these leadership roles don't see the value because they're not experiencing it. So how do we get more of those people to experience the benefits of fitness is, is number one. That, that's a question. Uh, secondly, you know, I think instantly people think like, oh, you're heavy breathing, so it's worse. I mm. think that's that's probably what happened. And they're just like checking the box. They don't want to have any, I think what happened is you had some people who are like, oh, at gyms, you're relatively close and you're breathing heavy. and eh, it sounds dangerous. Let's take it off. But they didn't think about the opposite side, right? The psychological sides, the in enhanced fitness, the weight loss, whatever it is. I think they were so worried about eliminating any risk that they forgot about the opposite side of it. You know what I also mm. think is that when you look at the <clears throat> the fitness space, it's so scattered and decentralized. Yeah, we don't have a lobby. We don't. Like Hollywood has a lobby. Yeah. Guess yeah. what industry in California remained open without masks, was allowed to film, was allowed to shoot, while shops were shut down and businesses were lost. <clears throat> Hollywood because they have political power do you think the people in yeah. our space realized we need to do something about our political yeah. poll because they don't they don't look at us like like yeah, a voting to, block or like we have any, any we need to work poll. on that there's there was a few of those that popped up some like coalitions that came together i don't think anything really moved with that but there's also major differences between some gyms right you have boutique personal training gyms that are one to one you have smaller fitness centers like ours where it's like 15 to 20 athletes yeah. and a coach. Then you have big box gyms, but they were all treated the same. There should have been uh, different perspectives on that. And also, maybe it also has to come down to taxes too. I would like to think mm. that it doesn't, but if you think about it in a service-based business, you're not paying taxes on the revenue mm. like you are in a restaurant or in a- um, That's a good point. Like if it's a retail, yeah. like our retail, we pay taxes on, but our monthly subscriptions, you No don't. taxes. So I wonder, I mean, but then again, you're That's paying- an interesting perspective. I've actually never heard anybody say that. And that makes it, that brings up a really good point, right? I, I, yeah, because Especially when government's making the yeah, decision. Yeah, because they're, they're thinking how much, how much revenue will we lose if we shut this down right. versus this down. And, and by the way, that's completely speculative, but it makes you wonder, yeah, right? A, um, yes, as a business, we're paying our appropriate taxes, but because it is this service-based business, you don't have the same taxes you would have on our retail shops, mm -hmm. right? Now our retailers are different. Um, but you'd hope that didn't play into it. I think ultimately what happened is you have decision makers weighing and just looking at risk. I, I was watching the news and they were talking about getting rid of the mask mandate. This one gentleman's like, it's time. People should be adults. And if they want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If they don't want to wear a mask, they shouldn't have to wear a mask. Then the woman, this woman gets interviewed. We should continue to wear a mask until every single COVID case is gone and there's zero deaths. <laughs> That's and not going like, to happen. But it's like, that, that's just, 
that, when that's have just we not ever possible. done that with any other disease? But it's just not possible. Well, <laughs> it's not realistic. It's, it's not, not realistic. And, and and there's there's inherent risk to anything. Getting in the car and coming here to record with you yeah, guys, yeah. there is a certain amount of oh risk. God, forget, but I think that there's forbid you use that analogy. But there's <laughs> so many benefits um, to fitness, and I, I just I think we need to do a better job talking about. It. Like you and I were talking about earlier. I mean, dude, think about it. Like not only diabetes, all these weight loss and all these kinds of things, but like just the psychological side and then yeah. feeling part of a of a group of like minded people. I mean, it's just. I think I don't know. one of the biggest wedges I've, I've never seen this in history was this information that was put out that asymptomatic people were like these super spreaders. And so people just lost their mind and anybody healthy on the street is now potentially like this. this and the media can really mess with your head. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm coming from a place where like, dude, it mess with my head. Yeah. Like I'll be like on Los Gatos Creek trail and think, Oh, you know, according to them, if I walk by someone, maybe they breathe on me, I'm going to get COVID. It's like, well, the media just, it, it really, and, and part of that was my fault. And I had to realize, Hey, Got to stop watching the news yeah. because it was it was just shut it off. You, you know what I love? We talked about this earlier, and we, this was off air. And you said, "Why weren't politicians standing up and saying, hey, as part of a way to protect yourself, oh. you should get in shape, you should eat right.'" And I and and I said to you, I said, "Well, because nobody gets reelected by saying it's your responsibility <laughs> to do this." Every <laughs> no, you have you, to have all the answers. Yeah, to get I have. Re-elected. I have all the answers. Now this this opens up something else. People who are fitness fanatics, we take our health uh, as our responsibility. And I think it bleeds into other things. And, and by the way, studies support this. People who exercise consistently tend to have this control what I can control and forget what I can't attitude more than people who don't because fitness teaches you that, doesn't it? It yeah. teaches you to, well, I mean, I'm not going to be as big as Arnold, but who cares? He's got different genetics. I have mine. I'm going to keep doing this anyway type of deal. Do you, do you, do you notice this? With well, it your- teaches you micro adversity. Mm. So that's a good way to put it. So, you know, like for example, I was with my daughter in the garage yesterday and we're having her do something and she wants to stop with a minute left. I'm like, Hey babe, like we could do this. Like, let's get through this together. Like you got one minute left, like let's go. And just that little thing, like in the garage on a regular basis or through training, you learn how to overcome micro adversity. And I say micro because dude, it's not a big deal. If she stopped a minute early, it's not that right. big of a deal. But learning how to overcome that, she starts for David Goggins, lack mm-hmm. of stealing his stuff, like callousing her mind to start overcoming some micro challenges. Maybe you didn't want to get one more rep on the squat rack, but you did. And I think those lessons we learn in the gym carry over really well into real life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about kids for a second. You have kids, and we talked about this earlier about how challenging it is now to get kids to be active. You know, when we were kids, you were relatively fit on accident. It was like a side effect because the only way you could see your friends and hang out you're was outside with, playing. You're outside you had to playing. ride your bike to their house. Yeah. Was, right. Now, now if the kids are social online and going outside, they're not connecting with other kids. And so we have to find ways of getting them to be active. Have you thought about this from a business perspective? Like, have you thought about moving in that direction of working with children or is that just the market that's just forget it? It's too hard. I don't really think about it from a business perspective. I think about it more from like, it's highly personal to me. Mm. Like, yeah as, a dad. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, as a dad, like, yes, there's probably a business case for it too, but it's just very, very personal for me. I think that it's a, um, there's a ton of issues, right? Childhood obesity. Uh, it's a national defense issue. Our, our, our future. Uh, I think that it's really important to get kids moving. And I think that we don't need to make it a big deal. So at a high level, what I teach my kids is that every single day they have to sweat once a day. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you're doing. You have to move your body and sweat once a day, preferably obviously getting your heart rate elevated and moving through a full range of motion. So if they want to go jump on the trampoline, they want to go play sports. If they want to go in the garage, I don't care what you do. You just got to do something. And I think that we just need more parents to, um, to also start looking at it as a way to bond with their kids too. Like go do something with them that's outdoors because it's so easy to give your kids. And I'm raising my hand saying, hey man, I, I get it. I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old. It's really easy to give them an iPad or whatnot. But what's better, I think in the long run is going out, throwing the ball, jump on a tra- uh, uh, trampoline or whatnot. And if you, and you don't have to be a fitness expert to get your kid moving through a range of motion. Hey, let's squat. Mm-hmm. Let's try and do some pressing. And what you start to realize when you start doing this with your kids is, man, there might be some deficiencies here that we could start working towards and maybe they'll get motivated by it. So I think it's a major issue. It's highly personal, but I haven't quite looked at it as a business. 
All right, let's take it. Let's take a left turn here and talk Uh-oh. about the, the app building <laughs> process. Uh, I, I've never been in, in, the, in. I've never tried to build an app. You don't want to build. We get know? well. I was just say, <laughs> we should. You should right preface there. it with that before we start. And a lot of mind pump listeners may, don't know this. That that's how Justin and I, before mind pump started, we were working together. Uh, Sal and uh, uh, our uh, Doug. Doug and Sal were building uh, Maps Anabolic. We had never all hung out. Justin and I were building an app called Level Up. Level and up. Uh, yeah, and it was what we, we were trying to gamify fitness. Yeah. We were trying to gamify fitness so that it, just what we're talking about right now with kids and just getting people active and moving through this app that was like a competitive game that was, and it was. We thought it was a brilliant idea, but turns it turns out we're not like tech wizards. It's yeah. just a monster, it's, and it's a lot to consider. What's, this, what's okay? Here's what's funny about that: I've never been in the process of building an app, so I have no idea. I know that apps exist. I use them. We get questions all the time. Leaving Why don't you guys app. build an Leaving app? app. Yeah. Do an app. Oh my god, an app would be so great. <laughs> so just, I would, and I don't bring it up anymore because <laughs> the answer I get from these guys is it's, it's yeah, we, consistent. We, we've shut you down. So I'm always like, hey guys, maybe we should. And you know, these guys are like, no, let's not <laughs> because <laughs> here's the here's the cost. It's actually way more expensive than you think. And all these, like, what's your experience building an app? Was it something yeah. that was it totally different than what you thought? Well, the first thing I'd say is you have to identify a really great partner to do with. When mm-hmm. I say partner, I'm not saying like financial partner, just someone that you pay that's really good. Yeah. And that's hard to learn because I don't know anything about apps. So one of the challenges is like, if you talk to me about, hey, I need you to go find a good coach. Okay, I got you. What's a good program? Okay, cool. But if you say, hey, um, how many hours do you think it'll take to build this app? <laughs> and the guy's like, it'll take 10,000 hours. And I'm like, okay, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, And so there's a lot of trust that's required when it comes to a, a development because we are not by trade software engineers. And so finding the right person that you could trust and then also identifying the right person who could speak to the software engineers mm-hmm. in their language were, were two critical things that I, we had to do. Now, fortunately, the first time around, it was okay. Spent a lot of money, learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Second time around, it's been much better. And I think we found the right people. Mm. Yeah. Is it is a big? What are some of the big considerations for someone listening right now who thinks, uh, "Oh, well, I want to do an app uh, for fitness." What are the big, like I guess, big rocks or big considerations aside from? Or what would you tell them? Would you tell them to do it or not do it, yeah. and why? <laughs> I think it depends on how much revenue potential you have as a company. Yeah. Uh, what is your end state? Right? Do you want to do in-app purchases? If 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 you don't, like, dude, maybe you should just rock it on the internet, right? But if you want to do in-app purchase, it could make sense. But what revenue, what is your um, you know, total available market? What's your TAM? What, what what type of ROI do you think you're gonna get? What really, really identify the financials because it's it's not as clear cut. So, like for example, if you go through Apple, they're taking 30% if you do over a million a year in revenue, they're taking 15% if you do less Didn't than they just get um, sued for that? Yeah, they're getting sued for that. But right now it's 15% of you mm-hmm. under um, a million. Okay, so right off the bat, 15% if you go that route. Mm-hmm. Now, in addition, your app, to build an app, let's just say a baseline app, you're looking anywhere from 100 to three, 400,000. Mm. Okay, so how long is it going to take? And by the way, way more than that. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I just said basic app. That's how they start yeah. you, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, tell yeah. you that. Oh, yeah, very, this will be about yeah. three or 400,000 yeah, million basic. dollars later. But then you also have right. when iOS updates, right? For example, there was just an iOS update. You have to also update your app. So there's monthly, <laughs> oh, ma- yeah. there's monthly maintenance fees. And so what I would say is do a deep dive and analysis on the cost and the benefits because it could be good for some people. For example, we have one. So at least we saw some value, but it's not going to be for everybody. So I, w- I would definitely deep dive on the financials because there's other options you could have. We have a, you know, password protected or a different type of system online. How long, how long will it take you? Have you forecasted this? How long will it take you to recoup the money that you spent on it? From the app, from it exactly, not the obviously the rest of your business. Well, I mean, obviously, if our app grows at the rate that we want it to, it, it's not going to be as long. Um, our finance guys would have a better idea of that, but I mean, I imagine probably a year. Um, well, that's not bad. That's not maybe, bad at all. maybe, I mean, maybe a, maybe more. So, what what one of the challenges we have with our app is we rolled this out in March, a new version of our app. So it's what what is that? Six months, mm-hmm. six months, and we had quite a few downloads. The NC Fit app available on iOS and Android. And uh, we have a, but it was a little bit confusing because we had a a variety of programs available and we had the on-demand. And one of the things we're trying to do in the fitness space is we're trying to see if we could bring on-demand follow-along functional training to people's garages. That's not the way people currently 
consume content in their garage. Mm -hmm. right. So we're so we're kind of going against the headwind a little bit. So Peloton has dominated the follow along industry. Mm -hmm. But it's on a, si a, a bike that's very stationary. It's designed for that, essentially. It's designed for that. What I was thinking is, hey, man, there's people in their garages who have been by themselves. Why can't they just mirror me on their TV screen mm -hmm. and do a workout with me and feel like they're a part of like a coached experience? Mm -hmm. But that's not the way most people train in their garage. So it, what we learned very quickly is that we're kind of trying to pioneer this. And so it might take some time. And it was confusing. So we had to re redo, and now we have onboarding screens to clearly guide them towards what they want to look at. You, you've been you've been a professional in fitness for a long time. So like us, you've seen the evolution of, of oh, yeah. media and fitness. Now, nowadays, fitness is very popular on social media, Instagram and other platforms. And when we, were, when we started, that wasn't even a part of the of discussion. Right. Do you see, and I know you have a podcast, for example, do you see, what value do you see in that as a business owner? Do you see value in doing things like podcasts and social media to augment or to build? What about for you personally? Is that something that is an area that you think has a lot of potential? I mean, I've struggled with it. Um, I'm sure maybe you guys have as well. I mean, the social media thing, I don't know if you've seen the recent um, stories going on with Facebook, but I mean, they're equating, I'm not saying this, there's other people that are saying it, that are equating it to almost like, uh, big, big tobacco, right? Oh, right. And, and and saying that the addictive nature of it, and the reason why I bring that up is because <laughs> I worry sometimes about how addictive it is for me, and what type of relationship do I want to have with social media, and what type of value can you add in a thirty second, one minute clip? Mm -hmm. So where I think I want to lean more towards in the future is our effort over everything podcast, YouTube. And then use these other channels to drive people there so we can have good collaborative conversations like this. How's yeah. that experience going? Talk to us about that. Because the last time we did talk, you were just starting to take off on your podcast, I believe. And so tell us about some of that that experience, the things you like, things you don't like, anything that's surprised you so far. Well, I think we originally had what's called a, a business of fitness podcast. And this was around for a while. And it was only for gym owners and coaches, really. That's right, I and it was, like, it was like, you know, a great resource for them. But what I found was like, at some point, I just kind of said everything I needed to say. And <laughs> like, it like yeah. you can only talk about the same things over and over again. I want to expand the things I talk about. Like I want to talk about coffee with people. I want to talk about an athlete and how they overcome certain challenges. And, and so that's why we rebranded it from business of fitness to basically put in the effort over everything. Like that's it. Like that's the goal. And so now it opens up the conversation. So the podcast is going good, but I need to put more time and attention into it because just like you guys, this beautiful space, if you want to grow something, you have to nurture it. And I feel like I've been just thinking it'll grow on its own, but I need to do a better job of taking ownership and doing the right job. On oh, it. talk about that. We, we just had a conversation. Um, I would say that is probably our Achilles heel, right? So when you get to kind of a place and we're, in, we're kind of similar places, although our business models are different, where you have all these different silos, right? And how hard is it for you to focus just on one thing and really go that? And how hard is it for you not to like, you know, squirrel, 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 oh. and be trying all these things? Like, <laughs> talk about I that. I used to be a lot worse. Um, I already have like attention, like all of us in this room, basically. We just, <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I, I already have attention problems because I'm, I'm, I'm very serial entrepreneurial like that. Like, oh, sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Yeah. And and uh, we've had to surround ourselves. With, I've had to surround myself with, with people who are much more constructive in the way that they think. They need that like kind of entrepreneurial side where we're trying to be innovative and push the threshold. But at the same time, um, I think the people we have at the business now hold me accountable that before we go out and we go do these ideas to make sure that we actually have a system and a structure in place to be successful. And that's why with the podcast, it's kind of been like, it's been, it's been going, but I think we need to sit back and say, hey, if we're gonna do this, let's do it right. Let's make it, let's make it good. Uh, let's let's really invest into a space why not or let's just kind of know where it's at as a business and so i think surrounding myself with good people we have a really great hq right now and team at uh at, at nc fit now being a serial entrepreneur you know you obviously have this the growth curve like anything else and I, I know that when you've done it for well over 10 years, that there's these pivotal moments that happen where either someone gives you this piece of ice or you learn something the hard way. What do you recall has been some of the, the best advice in, in terms of being an entrepreneur that has either changed your philosophy or laid the foundation on how you do business as an owner? I think coming to the conclusion of like, what do I really enjoy doing and what is going to add the most value for our business? Like if those two align, that's phenomenal right? But just evaluating, hey, 
what am, what am I spending my time on? What is not driving the best value for the business? And how do I spend my time on things that I'm uniquely good at and then hire out those other positions? Because I used to try and do everything on my own. And I think the the secret was, you know, this guy, I was, I was walking down the hallway of one of our gyms one time. He's like, hey man, I'm just letting you know if you get hit by a bus, your business is gone. It's just a hobby. I was like, okay, good, thanks. Wow. thanks man. <laughs> you know, I was like, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Just and me the it, it, it made me reflect and say, hey, how do I delegate more? How do I build this? And, and how do I elevate more people on our team so that the brand can grow bigger than just me. So that's what we've been really focused on. And it was because of that advice of treating it more like a business and less as a hobby and not making it just about me and me trying to do everything all that. What would you say is your, your Achilles heel then as, as a, as a business operator? As my Achilles heel? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm a terrible manager. I, I, I don't know how to manage people effectively because my whole thing is like, I think that people just kind of, Hey, let's go get this done. But people want, <laughs> People want guidance and direction. They want to know what success is. They want to know what their trajectory looks like. And and so no one, I don't have any redirect, direct reports. Like, like well, I have one. So the, the president of our company, uh, he report, he, we, we collaborate, but everybody else reports up directly into him. And then obviously I have multiple people I talk to on a regular basis, but I don't do their performance evaluations or any of that kind of stuff because I just, it's just not my strong suit. What is your strong suit then? What would you say is your, your, stro- the, your number one strength? I mean, creating relationships and then, and then, and then creating business deals from that, right? Mm. Like, like going out there and getting a new corporate wellness account, going out there and creating a new strategic partner to, um, to put our programming through, right? So we have we have channel partners that our programming goes into. So let's just say your gym uses Wattify, which is a member management system, creating that relationship and getting our business into their system. That's what I like to do. And that's what I think I'm good at. So tell us about this competition you're going to do coming up here. You've been competing in, in for a long time. That's <laughs> long how you kind time. of, I mean, that's how you're, you got some of your notoriety. Yeah. Um, so what is this legends competition? Is it, comp- is it like people who won in the past come together? That's yeah, what it sounds like. A little bit of that. Yeah. It's like, it's like, so, so as of recently, the things I, I, I haven't competed in a jiu- jujitsu competition in a little while just because of COVID. Um, but that's something I'm excited about, but this month in particular is this legends competition. So two years ago, rogue fitness put out the rogue invitation on it. If I'm not mistaken, it was the inaugural year. I actually, it was the inaugural year year. And they had what was called a legends competition. So they invited back, I don't know how to describe them. I mean, the best ever people who have really made a mark on the sport, uh, champions, whatever, right? For whatever reason, Rogue felt like these people qualify as legends. So it sounds to me like if you're a fan of the sport, People it's like you, a Hall of Fame. Yeah, people you'd want to see yeah. competing against each other that you know about type of deal. And it wasn't just so black and white where it was like, oh, we're going to take anyone who's placed in the top 10 and we're inviting them. It was That's cool. right. So it wasn't like, there's some people that are invited for the legends that have never been on the podium. That have never been on the podium. But they have a name for some reason. But they have a name. They've done something for the sport. They've they've in some way, shape, or form established themselves as legend status in CrossFit. Got yeah. it. Interesting. Hmm. And... Yeah. So, and, 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 and so the first competition was really interesting because they, they, they pitted it as an actual competition. So you actually show up there, we competed in multiple events and, um, they had a winner. And so I, I, I won that event, but it was, it was, I'm glad this year they're not really doing it the same way because the heart of the deal a couple of years ago was like, People are going to come down. We're going to throw down. We're going to have a great time. Mm-hmm. But as soon as they started placing a winner on it, which we didn't really know was going to be the, the way that it was. I mean, we knew there was going to be a winner, but the way that they did it created a sense of of competition that I think was was good for that year. It was great. But this year, I think it's better that they just are making it more as an exhibition where people are just going to do events, but they're not going to crown a winner. Yeah, but let's let's be yeah. honest, though. Yeah, I, just, I was going to take <laughs> the, play, tell me who do you look forward to beating well, the, the most? Well, the reason why- <laughs> Who do you look forward to beating the most? <laughs> well, the reason why it's weird is is last time they, they set up the schedule. This year, it's on Halloween. So like using myself as an example, I'm not going to stay for the entire event. So I'm only going to go there for like the events on Friday and maybe an event on Saturday, and then I'm leaving. So no matter what, I couldn't win. So I like the way they did it as a Yeah, but you still want to beat everybody it, that you competed against yeah. that day. So yeah. my goal, my <laughs> my goal for this particular event, just where I'm at in my life, man. And and even a couple of years ago, I didn't I didn't plan to win. That wasn't my intention was to go there, look good. Right? <laughs> I want to look I want to look fit uh, with a shirt off or shirt on whatever. 
and I want to be competitive. That was the goal a couple of years ago, <laughs> and it's still the goal this year. Yeah, well, so, okay, so so this I'll tell you a story because I, I I'd love to ask you this. I, years ago, when I was managing gyms, I remember I got to a general manager status. I was grand opening clubs, and in, in those days. General managers will, you, you were encouraged to sell yourself, but yeah. that wasn't your main goal. Your main goal was to teach people under you to sell, to produce revenue. But in order to become a general manager, at one point, you were one of the top sales guys. Right. So right. we grand opened a club, and this was brilliant move from, from the district, uh, from the divisional president. Divisional president comes down and, pl and picks general managers from the, from the division, so all over California, and says, on the grand opening... I want all you guys to go to this club and then first place is going to win a thousand dollars and bragging rights. So I felt this like, Oh fuck, I get to do this again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I get to compete against all these guys and let's see who can be the best. And it, it, it got me excited because I love to do that. Do you feel that a little bit from this? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I, I mean, I definitely, um, yes, I do. It gives you a, an idea to train for. And I just need to know where I'm at. Like, um, a couple of years ago, I was even in a, even in a different headspace when I won it. Where so I stopped competing professionally in CrossFit in 2016. Um, as you, so when my daughter got sick, I stopped competing professionally. Mm -hmm. I then didn't compete again in any CrossFit event, well except for like little team stuff here and there for fun, until the Rogue Invitational in 2019. And now this is the next time. So I am excited. I'm, I'm excited because I like I like creating goals based on fitness. Like two weeks ago, I went and did a century ride, 100, 100 miles on a bike. Uh, a couple months before that, I did another event. Um, I have a ruck event coming up. I want to go compete in, in jujitsu competition. I like having these these pylons that I could try and shoot for that keep me um, on my toes fitness-wise that then translates into business as well. They're and fun. family. They're fun. I did a century drive the other day, actually. Drove. Yeah. <laughs> so the century drive. Yeah, so let's talk about jujitsu. Um, what, what brought you to jujitsu and what's up with the, like, how far oh, are uh, you? Like, where purple, are you right? And, you purple belt? Yeah. I'm like, only that's, one purple belt in the room is what I heard. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. that, by the way, that's when the competition, you know this, it's when it starts to get really hard now at, at that yeah, level. How's it been for yeah, you? So I've been a purple belt since pre-COVID. So I think I'll be here for I don't know, we'll see how much longer I'll be at Purple Belt for. But um, the way jiu-jitsu works, there's a, a white belt, uh, a blue belt, a purple belt, a brown, and then a black. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because there's only five belts. So you could be at a belt for a really long time. Oh, yeah. And uh, I love jiu-jitsu because um, I, I like what it does because I'm, I'm constantly learning something new. And the presence and focus required on the mat is unlike anything else. And if I could take that presence and focus that I'm even having right now with you guys. And if I could then put it on the mat and then take it into other areas of my life, I'm winning. Well, so let's talk about this for a second because I remember when I first did it, I was uh, early 20s, 220 pounds, lifted weights. I had a little bit of judo experience as a kid, but I didn't do anything for a while. And I walked in there, big, strong dude, and got humbled by a 150-pound skinny instructor. And I loved it. Like, talk about how humbling it is being a fit, strong, I mean, CrossFit champion – going against i'm sure for a long time you went against dudes that were half your size half your strength and just tapping out like crazy what like what, what's that yeah, I, mean, about? I mean that's the thing about jiu-jitsu so the, what i fell in love with in crossfit was years and years ago i started in the conventional gym just like all of us mm -hmm. right and i buys and tries chest and back cardio i get it all good and then i found crossfit and it was like oh i'm gonna teach you how to do a bar muscle up you're like what and then it's like a rope climb what a, a you know a snatch and I was very inspired because I saw dramatic improvements on a regular basis very, very quickly. So my snatch went from 100 pounds to 200 pounds, whatever it is, right? What happened is after competing professionally, seeing all these different coaches, you maybe make like 1% better, but yeah. you didn't make these big gains. And I missed that. Then I found jujitsu. And in jujitsu, you could feel like you're making massive improvements every single day because you learn a technique that could have such a big impact on your on your training. So what it does, it's not only a physical thing for me, it's a lot of mental chess as well. And so I've had to humble myself um, in the sense that when you go in there and you're, and, you're, and you're thrown down, there's a large learning curve because there's so much to learn. But once you learn a baseline, then it's 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 really exciting. I yeah. think you gotta give it six months, and you gotta you gotta be okay to put your ego at the door because those guys will check that shit real quick. <laughs> oh oh, real fast. Yeah. Real, real oh, fast. if you're trying to be a jerk, 
the uh, people, they'll send the arm breaker after. Oh yeah, they will. Yeah, totally. I want to I want to take you actually back to CrossFit again because I think I don't think I've ever had a chance to ask you this question. Sure. Uh, um, is and you're probably not in this headspace anymore, but at one point you had to been. Uh, did you have a nemesis? Did you have someone you loved to beat who just used to get under your skin and like? Did you have a guy like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously. So Rich Froney and I we went back and forth quite a bit, a lot. So him and I compete against each other. So he won. So in 2013, he took first, I took second. In 2014, he took first, I took third. And we competed together on Team USA three times. We, so yes, I would say that Rich at the time was, was the nemesis. And, uh, or the, the, but it was good for both of us. Like actually at one point, I even wrote up in my garage, what's Rich doing as a daily reminder that this dude's probably training hard and you're being a little wimp staying inside the house, go out there and train. <laughs> That, that, you know, that was just my way of kind of like inspiring myself. Yeah. Um, but yes, so rich. And, and I think it was good for the sport at the time. There was a lot of, you know, throwing down. Yeah. It's it, fun, man. Yeah. Is it, now, are you guys friends, though, outside of outside of the competition? You guys are close yeah. friends, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, we're, well, I mean, we yes. Like, we'll see each other at the invitation. We'll be able to, you know, catch up. Um, but, like, we were also on the same team. So, we represented USA in three uh, CrossFit competitions. So for that alone, you create a really good, great bond. Do you, do you foresee like, and we're seeing this right now with like uh, Instagram celebrities getting into fighting and boxing and the way people are using social <laughs> oh, media. Oh, yeah, do you, so, do you, did think, you see the Josh Bridges, Jacob Hepner one? No, I didn't no, see that. What? So have, I don't know if you guys know who either of those guys are, but so Josh Bridges is, um, former Navy SEAL, uh, CrossFit games competitor. And he boxed against this guy, Jacob Hepner, also former CrossFit games champion or CrossFit Games uh, competitor, they boxed actually in Dubai with um, uh, Steffi Cohen. Oh, oh she was, they, yeah, were she was on that they were on that card. They were on that card. And so they were on this card, and um, I think it's good for the sport. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's right up on the screen. Bridges enter the ring nearly eight. Yeah, so uh, Jacob ended up winning, but it was really interesting because it's good to see our sport transition outside the gym. A lot of people in CrossFit do CrossFit to get better at CrossFit and working out. But I wish they would realize just how well it translates in everything else, biking, jujitsu, getting outside. And this is a great example of that, I think. Well, that's what I was driving towards was I was, you know, I'm wondering if we're going to see an evolution of the sport of CrossFit where, uh, and why I asked kind of the nemesis question is because, you know, are you, because of oh, social media, is yeah. there drama, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like that's you, a good Like one. a Jake Paul doing that yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, do, are, you, are you seeing that yet start to happen? Like where guys are like picking fights? In, to, Dude, I mean, well, you saw it here, uh, which I was surprised. But, you know, ultimately it's like if people are going to pay for some great entertainment and it's going to be something that's cool for these guys to train for, I'm yeah. all for it. Like some people are like, oh, you know, stick to CrossFit. It's like, bro, like CrossFit, the, one of the first rules is, is, is regularly play new sports. That's like one of the things. And some, somehow along the journey, we, we forgot that. And so I think these guys getting out there and doing that is great. And I think if there's an opportunity for me, I'd, I'd love to take it up. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but uh, it'd be fun. I'll find something for you to yeah. fight. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. We'll see. Twenty-four hour fitness founder fights. Uh, you, no. <laughs> founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, that's a lot of fun. So, all right, moving forward, what are the, what's the big focus uh, for you guys? Are you predicting? Are you guys prepared for maybe future shutdowns? Are you setting yourself up that way? Are you looking at okay, it's going to settle down. We're going to keep moving forward the way that we have. Like, what's that look look like for I, you? I, I hope that we don't have to have this discussion again. Like, I, I I really hope that we've learned from the past and that shutting down gyms is just not a good idea. And so I'm anticipating that we will not, and I really hope we don't because it's going to put us in a really difficult position. You know, since the beginning, we said, well, hey, we're going to abide by state and county laws. But at some point, you know, we have to also think about our staff and our members, and there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. So... Right now, we're planning on, hey, the gym's going to be open. We're going to hit our roaring 20s come in January. We're going to get new people back in the gym. Um, they're going to be thriving. That's like, I, I visualize that, right? And then we're going to try and impact as many people through our online products, whether that's for gym owners or for, for athletes through the NC Fit app. Are they requiring, I don't know if this is even, a, is this a law yet? Are they requiring gyms to add, to require members to be vaccinated? Or is that just what some gyms are deciding to do? So it uh, depends on your county. Um, in San Francisco County, it, 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 or in San Francisco City or County. You're required to show. They're required. Oh. Um, I have conflicting views on that a little bit. I think that uh, you're really, 
I struggle with that one a lot. Mm. Um, even though I think that like 95% of our audience is vaccinated here in California, I, I think there's some privacy and, and I think that people should be able to make the best decision for them. And I think that, uh, like, look, I am vaccinated, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you, I think there's probably a large group of people who are in a, who are in a certain cohort that probably should get it. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you choose not to, after all the data and all the, whatever, like that's your decision. And, um, as a business, it's, it's very unfortunate if they place that upon you to, to, to be the common denominator where you're actually policing that. That's what I was going to ask. Like, what do they have to show? Just the card and then you mark it in their system and then it's only good for a certain period of time? Or is it like, how does, it, how does that work? Well, then, and then when does it stop? Like, then, mm. then if there's another shot next year, do I have to then re-up their vaccination card? It becomes very, very complicated. Um, so like right now, for example, I wanted to go to the movie theaters. Um, have you guys been to the Prune Yard movie theaters? Yeah, I love it. Oh, they're legit. Yeah. They required vaccine. Oh, I didn't know vaccine. that. Oh, so, oh, I didn't know that. So I, there's this app on your phone. It, it just, there's a QR code. It pops up. I mean, I don't know how well people look at it, but you have to show it to the person there. And I just, I don't know. We will not, we will not do that. Uh, without being mandated. And if we are mandated, it'll require a conversation as a leadership team on what we want to do there. But I don't think that the government should be doing that and placing that burden on small business because they're putting you in between a rock and a hard place. They really are. And um, right yeah, now- who, the, who pays the price if, if if you check it wrong or if it's expired or if they falsify it? Like, it's really interesting. It's, Nobody's it's, considering this. No one's considering that. Or or yes, there's a variety of different things like Santa Clara County put out. This is a long time ago that we needed to um, check in with each one of our employees to see who's vaccinated and who's not. We need to keep track. And that was very difficult for us because I said we did it right. We did it. But because that wasn't infringing, that was that was tough for me to do. But I didn't feel like it was that big of a deal because if you're not, that's fine. But I didn't want to know about it, meaning. I didn't want to be aware of who's vaccinated or who's not mm -hmm. because just in case someone need to leave or we need to make a you know employment change, I don't want them to be able to come back and say it's because of those reasons. Like Got it. what's going to happen with those cases? Right. What a good point. What yeah. a good point. Like, like yeah, what what I find most interesting is my own two set two cents. They don't count natural immunity. So you can show that you're vaccinated but you but they don't give you any opportunity to show that you've had covid and have natural immunity which studies now show to be the best form of immunity. They don't count it at all. And that just, in my, I mean, look, my opinion, that fuels the conspiracy theories that the big pharma is partnering with big government because why wouldn't they count? If, if that's the goal, why aren't they counting natural immunity? Why is it only vaccination? That, to me, that part right there is very inconsistent. Well, make that's, sense? that's very inconsistent. And then also for me, what's tough too is like, you know, I got vaccinated and then I still got COVID. And then I was still able to give it to my kids. And, and so, you know, I don't know. It depends. Look, this is a very complicated conversation because depending on what resources you look at, what sources you look at on news, you could go either way. Meaning you could find some data that backs up that if you're vaccinated, your viral load and all this kind of stuff is significantly less. And that's why you should get vaccinated because it's greater. It's good for the greater good of all the people in, in, the, in the environment. Or you can see others that say that it doesn't make too much of a difference. So you can still spread it just as easy. It depends on what, what you're looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's it's for that reason, like it's just... What, what I don't like is that it's placing small business, including ourselves, in a in an impossible situation where you have some members that feel super strongly about one way and you have some members that feel super strong the other way. And the gym is supposed to be a place where people should just come in, not talk politics, not talk any of that, and be a free space for them to enhance their life. And um, Yeah, I don't remember who I was talking to. I can't remember who I was talking about, but to, but one of, one of their favorite things about the gym culture, and I agree with this, is, and all of us have experienced this, you go into the weight room and you work out, and it doesn't matter what color your skin is. doesn't matter if you're male or female. doesn't matter who you voted for. Nobody cares, especially the gyms where people are serious. Nobody gives a shit. It's all about we're working out. Mm -hmm. We're working hard. It's we respect each other. That's it. And it's funny because they're, you know people are afraid or intimidated of the weight room. I tell you what, you go to the weight room with the most hardcore members, and if you don't know what you're doing and you need help, the most experienced, hardcore, big, jacked, scary-looking people will be the nicest, nicest and people. will help you the most. And, it, and they don't care how rich you are, how poor you are. They don't care what you do for a living it's or incredible. what the color of your skin is, right? It, it's incredible. It, it is. It, it's just like this neutral zone where everybody's just cool and everybody just wants to put in the work and they want to do it together. And they re, there's a lot of mutual respect in gyms because they know that you had the decision. Like I said this to, I took 6 a.m. class yesterday. I said it to all the members. I said, guys, I really appreciate every one of you guys. You could be out 
at home eating a Krispy Kreme or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or sleeping. But you chose to come in here and bust your butt. And I'm really grateful for you doing that. And I think that that overall sentiment in the gym is what the culture has created, you know? It is. Yeah. I had an experience as a kid, as a 16-year-old kid, working out, learning, and a group of, the, uh, at the time, the biggest, strongest dudes I'd ever seen in my life, a group of powerlifters, yeah. literally started helping me and taught me how to squat and taught me how to work out. Right there. They took their time to do it. This, these grown men. And I, it was just such an impactful thing to me. And I did that as a grown man myself. When I see a kid in the gym or someone who doesn't know what they're doing, and I, and, and you know, I, they're really, they're trying really hard to change that in gyms. And it's sad because it's one of the most, I think one of the most beneficial things of fitness facilities is that environment right there. Yeah. We need to continue to have more conversations like this and get more people in the gym and do it in a constructive way. Like, you know, if you live in the Bay Area, you want to come by an NC Fit, we'd love to have you meet a coach and just have a great conversation about what are you trying to do and how we can help you? But if you don't live in the Bay Area, go find a gym, go find a coach or go jump on a program. But I think it's like, we got to do something, you know, something is better than nothing. And it starts creating these habits that then can really make a big impact. Like even like these morning walks that I've been doing, like take a backpack, put a couple water bottles in it. So there's a little bit of load. So it opens your shoulders, especially if you're sitting at a desk all day and go out for a, you know, 30 minute walk to start the day. It's a great way to jumpstart the day. I think. Love Excellent, that. man. Well, you're always fun to talk to you, brother. You're very motivating and we, we appreciate you coming on the show. So this is, this is great. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, it's been a great time. I appreciate being here, man. Yeah, Thanks. Time, Jack. All right.